We must be cautious. Welcome to the Nerd Party. Hi, this is Nick Anastasiu, story editor on Star Wars The Clone Wars and Star Wars Bad Batch. And you are listening to Aggressive Negotiations. Well, hello and welcome to Aggressive Negotiations. And I am Matthew Rushing and we are coming at you live from the Waterfall District of Naboo. And John, it is feeling fabulous out here. Uh, I mean, it's what a perfect day for a picnic. Uh, How are you doing, man? I don't know. I'm trying to find my way back to the Hammock District. I really want to find the Hammock District and buy a nice hammock. And then Mm -hmm. uh, basically get a good vantage point to watch what I think is going to be quite the rumble between the battle droids and the Gungans and just sort of like set up there, get a nice, uh, uh, what what would, I'll tell you what, should I be looking for the Star Wars equivalent of a mint julep or a, uh, an Arnold Palmer? Which one of those two should I be going for? I mean, I don't know. As Nick Bargatze would say, I mean, gosh, you know, what's it like to have two trees that close together? So uh, (laughs) you and your hammock privilege. But uh, anyway, uh, before we get further off track, you can find us wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, We would love it if you go over to Apple Podcasts, give us a star rating and review. We'd really appreciate it. Uh, It's been a while since we've had one of those, and we could also uh, interact with you on social media. We would love that. At the Jedi Masters on X Twitter, as well as at Join Nerd Party on Twitter for the entire network. You can also find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash the nerd party. You can also find us online at the nerdparty.com as well as Instagram at the nerd party. Uh, so John, I have uh, a surprise topic for you. Uh, I sent Ooh. you a image uh, yes. that you were like, huh? Okay. And I was like, don't worry. There's a reason for me sending you this image of all of these Jedi uh, in kind of like cartoon like form. And the reason is this. So the new series, The Acolyte, has come out. And one of the things that's interesting about The Acolyte uh, is that all of the Jedi seem to basically wear uh, the same robes. They all pretty much have basically the same robes maybe a slight variation here and there but mostly they all seem to go to the same tailor uh there's not a lot of variations in their look which is is interesting and yet when we get to the prequel era one of the things that we notice is that there is quite a bit of variation in the uh star wars uh, Jedi robe business. It's it's almost as if the tailor uh, at the Jedi Order just started having people come in um, a bit like they were going to choose their wands uh, and had to, through the Force, find the right outfit for that Jedi. And so, one, I just wanted to ask you, why do you think, you know, I, I, that was facetious, of course, but why do you think... Uh, fashion changed for the Jedi in this way where it it does seem to be much more individualistic. I, you know, I, first off, I want to say that this is a treat that we're having our very first fashion show here yes. on Aggressive Negotiations. Fashion show, fashion show, we've fashion show at the We've known each other for so temple. many years and we've never discussed fashion quite like this. So I'm thrilled because uh, I'm a fashion aficionado, a fashionado, fashion a fashion, sure, a fashion, like a fashionado. There we go. Mm. Uh, with a, a particular focus on boots, Jedi boots have always been a thing for me. It's weird. I can't. And there's explain a lot it of variations to those too. Yes, there there are, and I, I will say special shout out to Qui Gon's boots. Always enjoyed them a great deal. So, uh, y- your point's very valid. Uh, what could possibly have changed? Because the thing is, I don't want to turn this into yeah, it, it should be this or it should be that. There is a possibility here, if I lay over, now the the Acolyte series as we record this hasn't finished, I would offer this, that what's possible is that if I try to construct a headcanon reason for it, is that the Jedi used to have more uniform dress Ah, uniform dress for uniforms. Yes. Yes. Uh, basically, to be more reflective of a more 
uh, strict order, a strict style or something like that, where it's like it, it was more strict. Whereas by the time we get to the prequel era, of course, we have more individual expression. Maybe it shows that the order has decided to loosen up a little bit and say, express yourself, give tribute to your culture express and your heritage. Yourself. <laughs> Basically. But, you know, like uh, sometimes the robes are specific specifically um, in the prequel era. You could say, oh, well, um, you know, uh, Luminara Unduli wears hers that way because it's the culture that she comes from. And while she doesn't have any attachment to her family, they still have her in that garb as a, uh, you know, like Shakti. It's it's a tribute to where she came from to show that the Jedi aren't just a monotonous blob, but rather from the many one as opposed to just like a collectivist whole. I don't know. That's the best I can do because you caught me completely off guard with this because I was I thought you were going to talk about lightsaber colors and everything and, and handles and stuff like that. Now you throw this fashion thing. That's the best I can do on, on, on the fly like that. What like where would you come at it with? So I do like the the thought process that you went where you kind of go from a more collectivist mindset to maybe a, a slightly more individualistic mindset with the Jedi. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I, what I mean is, is that uh, – and I think that you kind of were on this trend as well, that the, the Jedi had become by what we knew in the prequel era – a little bit more in tune with the idea of the force um, creating diversity, right? Of of like what people wear. They weren't so worried about what people wore. And like you mentioned, it, it, it was a way for the Jedi in some ways to kind of reflect the galaxy at large, right? You know, not every – being looks the same in the galaxy. Not every Jedi dresses the same in the galaxy. It, it was a way to express kind of uh, your connection with the Force in the same way, uh, you know, your lightsaber color kind of had a, a, a similar reflection as you bonded with your crystal. Uh, it came out with the color of, of, say, blue, green, yellow. We even see we've seen purple um, now. And and so um, I, to me, that's that that's the thought process that I had in my mind is that um, there's actually a bit more freedom in the force. Uh, yeah. There's there's a little bit more. Um, it's more forceful fashion because it's more force forward. Like we're 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 allowing one a being to be themselves in the force. And it also, I think, in some ways almost reflects a little bit of the the thought process that we had um, you know, when we were reading the old EU, right? And what and we thought about what the Jedi might be like mm -hmm. and that we thought of them kind of being these um warrior monks you know going around and helping people in the galaxy and and one of the ways they reflected that was by wearing robes that um helped that helped them blend in but at the same time kind of fit with the cultures around them and in the cultures they may have come from um and i mean it's so interesting because you do end up with uh such a variety, like you mentioned, Luminara and Dooley, and in the way in which you know her robes are very ornate. The headdress that she wears is particular to her as a character. Um, the only other one you see that's somewhat similar is is her uh, Padawan and Barriss Offy. But then you have a completely different type of Jedi, and and somebody like we got with uh, Ala Secura. Mm -hmm. You know, very different from, you know, say uh, what you got with Shock T. Uh, and so like or Adigalia, different from those two. Um, and so like I think that's that's really fascinating to me that these characters in some ways maybe got to be slightly more expressive of of themselves, you know, in the force. And that was reflected in their clothing. Well, I'll, I'll offer this as well, and I know this could be a controversial statement, but maybe tacked on if we're constructing headcanon and have a little fun with this. By this point in the Acolyte, the Jedi do not appear to be the fighters that we got accustomed to in the prequel era and the Clone Wars, right? I'm, 
I'm offering that as a ginger criticism because people have fixated on it. And I, I'm merely saying that in a playful way, maybe what we're finding out is that additionally, the robes changed so that maybe after this, the Jedi realize we need to be able to, we need to be able to throw down when push comes to shove. And therefore I, you know, as a Jedi master have to find robes that enable me to move the way I need to. And these uniform robes maybe didn't help the Jedi. Everybody has a different fighting style. Everybody has a different body type. Everybody has a different connection. So maybe it is even a step further where it's like, you know, you might run into trouble on the road. You should definitely wear something that's going to enable you to be able to move and flow quickly and easily, uh, you know, when push comes to shove. And maybe these current robes, you know, now now I go off in the funny way, if anybody watched Seinfeld, where you, you start having the discussion of, uh, you know, when Costanza comes in and he's like, you know, you should really be wearing cotton. Look at that. It's breathable. It stretches. And then the Yankees wash their uniforms and they all shrink and then yeah. they can't move <laughs> and stuff like that. Well, I I did, you know, say this facetiously earlier, but in some ways I do think that there is maybe something more to the idea of a a Jedi almost going to an Ollivander's, but the the mm. Jedi Taylor, you know, and I mean, because like, come on, you you know, you you see Quinlan Voss, who who's like every level of dude bro Jedi you could see, right? He's got the sleeveless look, you know. He's he's super cool. He's got the awesome dreadlocks and everything, and it's like. That's his look, man. He's just, he's, he's hip. He's cool with it. You know, whatever's going to happen, <laughs> it's going to happen, man. Uh, he's, 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 you know, he, he feels like he just walked out of a, you know, Jimmy Buffett, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. you know what I'm saying? A concert. Uh, he, he, he looks like he smells like he walked out of a Jimmy Buffett concert. Yes, he does. Yes, but, uh, he does. which is not a knock on anybody that went to a Jimmy Buffett concert. I've been to one too. Wink, wink. We are all, we've all been through this, but like, um, you know, but the thing is now I'm sort of like going down that robot chicken Star Wars detour sort of thing where with what you're saying, it's like, was there like a Jedi fashion season every year or two where like the tailor would be down there and like debuting new fashions and new styles and stuff like that? And maybe what we see is between High Republic and the prequel era, like after this period, they were like, we need some we need something fresh. We need something new. So they like hire somebody to come in who isn't a Jedi and like, come on, let's make it, let's make it sing. And, you know, and they, they have somebody like, uh, you know, <laughs> Mugatu from Zoolander or something like that, where it's like, we're going to make these Jedi work and they're going to, and you have like a whole runway. Like I could actually see this bit being like, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, you cap it off with like Yoda rocking the classic look, but this year it's, uh, it's Sans Belt. Right. It's it's the beltless trench coat sort of look for him. And you, you so you have like the, this whole fashion show sort of thing. Like I'm on board with this. I want somebody to put that together where it's like we, we see the, the transition of the robes and it's it's just this the new fashion scene uh, uh, busts into the temple. But, you know, you mentioned the robes helping them blend in when they go out into the world and I'd say that's actually something that's very, very uh, insightful because when Qui-Gon goes out into the world, he throws the covering on but he, and he ditches the cloak, but he's not changed his clothes really. He's, mm -hmm. He looks like anybody on the street, whereas in, in this era, what we're seeing, the Jedi could not blend in for love or money. They stick out right. like a sore yeah. thumb. And so, yeah, that's easily, you know, that you could easily headcanon that into existence as well. I mean, I love the idea that every year they have basically Project Runway, you know, at the Jedi Temple. And, it just works. Uh, you know, you've got your uh, Tim Gunn Jedi just being like, make it work, you know, <laughs> and uh, you've got the, you got the, got the, 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 the Jedi fashionistas that are, you know, yes. trying to come up with the newest look for that, that year. Um, 
before BBY, you know. Um, oh, and, ooh, uh, you could e- you could even have a Jedi <laughs> and like what they do is they meditate for like months at a time. Yes, exactly. This year's fabric exactly. will be yeah. Kashiki and silk, right? Mm, and it's like it becomes yes, the new rage. Yes. Yes. See, I love it. Well, and yes. So I do think it is interesting, though. Uh, and, and of course, this is a fun, just kind of silly conversation. But I, I love that. In many ways, there is a semblance of similarity to a lot of these Jedi, you know, uniforms from and robes from the prequel era. And yet again, there was this freedom to really accentuate the character through the clothing that they wore. And it told you something about the character the moment they came on screen. Um and I think that's one of the things that's actually really helpful about this era as well. You know, when you were having so many Jedi that were meeting, especially when you get to the Clone Wars, their robes did tell you something about them. You know, we're making fun of Quinlan Voss, but the moment you saw him on screen, come on screen, you know, he wasn't just a comic anymore, and he felt like that character you saw in the comic. And then his personality with the voice matched that all. It told you something very, yep. you know, importantly, um, you know, you, you see the I, I think Luminara or the regalness of of, of somebody like a shock T. Mm-hmm. It tells you something about that character. Right. Um, you think of the cr- clean crispness and classicness, right, of Obi-Wan's choice of robes, the color palette, um, always looking impeccable. You know, there's something about that 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 tells you. Anakin, you've got the darker, moodier look. I mean, Well, yeah, he's got leather. He got, uh, because... Right, yes. I I, I think what you're really honing in on there, and again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna couch this as, as, you know, as um, non-critically as possible sort of thing. But I think what it is, is we were very spoiled as well with, um, I think uh, it, it, she's a Scottish costume designer, Trisha Bigar. Oh um, yes, yeah, who, yeah, yeah. She was I, the. I believe you're on the right track there. Yeah, yeah. She she was the she was the costume designer for the prequels, and I think that it's definitely a conscious decision in the acolyte from the costumer to have everybody in this sameness. There's a little variance here and there, but there there's this sameness to the way everybody looks. Whereas um, uh, Big R had what you're talking about. Every not, it wasn't just the Jedi, but it was every single character. Amidala walks on screen, and you looked at her, and you went regal. I see the cultural influence. I see where you went with this. I know what this character, I know the core of this character based on what she looks because film is a visual medium. Right. I think what we miss with the Acolyte's costuming choices, and they are choices, and mm-hmm. you know right. they, they work this way, they work that way, they may be saying something, but the difficulty with the choices that they've made is the fact that you know, what you're getting at, I can look at a Jedi in the prequels or in Clone Wars even, and I can say, I can size up that character. I can look at Pong Krell and I can immediately see him and his costuming itself is like, eh, there's something about this guy that isn't settling right with me. It looks a little right. too militaristic menacing the way he wears his clothes. And I think, I honestly think that the costuming is making it a little bit of a challenge to have as much distinction between the Jedi character types at a glance. Mm -hmm. And as I'm getting to know these characters, I don't have an easy visual shorthand. Like you said, when I look at Anakin, if I've never met him before, but I see Obi-Wan and then I see Anakin, oh, Anakin's dressed a little darker a little edgier. He looks a little more imposing. That's odd because, you know, 
Obi-Wan has very warm earth tones. He's right. very approachable yep. looking. Whereas if I saw Anakin in his outfit walking down, I'm like, eh, this guy seems like he's a little bit, you know, uh, you know, m- m- might have a few anger. Mm-hmm. Like literally there's a darkness right. enveloping yes, him. Exactly. And exactly. Uh, I think that's, that's the difficulty with the, the acolytes, you know, costuming choices is I can't tell at a glance who like the, the nature of a character. And I know, I know the old adage, you can't judge a book by its cover. That's very true. But film is a visual medium and you got to give me every crutch possible for me to be able to sit down and say that guy's that guy. I mean, look at, look at, um, as the joke goes right now, Darth teeth, that character shows up and I go evil, bad, creepy. Yeah. Horror show. I need that for everybody. I need to be able to tell at a glance for everybody how that mm-hmm. is working. Yeah. That's my yeah, take no, on it, at least. No, I agree. I mean, I think, um, you know, you you immediately know that Smilo Wren is no good, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, to, to credit a friend of ours, uh, he knows who he is. He's listening to the show. We appreciate you, buddy. Uh, yes, you just got a shout out there. Um, but... You know, I, I do think that there is something incredibly – I mean, you even just think about that, though. Um, I, I'm thinking back to when you see the scene in the Attack of the Clones, right? And you have all of these Jedi in the arena, and each one of them kind of has this distinctive look. It's not just that they're different aliens, but they have these different – uh, robe choices and everything and so when you see them they do look distinct from everybody else and therefore you're not um confused at who you're looking at but you but again like you also get a a sense of who they are i mean and 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 it's helped by even just the the quick moment like um i think of uh having kit fisto right and he's got these wonderful earth tone robes you know and then he gives you that big smile and it just seems like okay basically you get the sense of okay this character is like uh obi-wan kenobi but maybe a little more loose right just from the quick look that you get from him and so and you, I think you made a great point. Don't don't let this go to your head. But um, <laughs> it's it's one of those things where it goes to show you that every single choice that you make in the visual medium is meant to try to tell you something about the characters that can be difficult to do if you just basically said, well this dude is this and this dude is this, right? And so when you don't have any differentiation and you have a sameness, you kind of end up in the place where almost everybody just kind of feels a little bit more like a stormtrooper, you know, than somebody uh, distinct. And that, Mm -hmm. I think, in some ways is kind of a problem for uh, a series. And I think it's one of the joys that we got with the, the prequel era in, in having all of these Jedi jump off the screen immediately just through kind of what they're wearing and what it can tell you. I mean, I even think, again, Attack of the Clones, you know, you go to the Jedi Library and Jocasta New is in this incredibly ornate set of robes. And what does that tell you about her? That she is somebody who's super uptight and what she cares about is what people think of her and what she looks like and the knowledge she carries around. And she wears that on her sleeve, basically, right? I mean, it's it's just a, an incredibly interesting thing uh, to see. Whereas you get the other side, you've got Master Yoda, who's in the most blasé robes possible. It looks mm-hmm. like the dude wears pajamas all day and is completely comfortable, couldn't care less what people think about what he looks like. <laughs> the thing is, the way you phrase that reminds me of, I think it was the last episode of Cheers ever. Classic sitcom, if anybody wants to watch it. Went out while well, it was still going strong. God bless it. It's one of the best shows that was ever on television. Um where Cliff Clavin, the know-it-all character, is having a discussion about what made the great philosophers um, great thinkers, and he said it was comfortable shoes. And so that sort of 
<laughs> you know, and somebody like throws somebody out there and he's like, well, barefoot. And look at that. One of the great thinkers. And it's like Yoda's the same way. He's in pajamas exactly. and barefoot. He's, yep. No wonder he's so great. He's absolutely chill. But you're right. Hey, it, I mean, on a, you know, look, we're both astute enough to know that Yoda's costume stems from necessity as much as anything else. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, we've see, we we saw the the outtakes where they actually put the hood over oh, his yeah. ears. And yeah. it's like, oh, oh, thank goodness they didn't go with that. In you fact, know? I think, isn't it the, uh, the Tartakovsky uh, one where they have him on Ilum and he has his hood up, but his ears are still out of the hood? I believe. I believe you're right. And so, yes, I, like, know, they didn't even try to get around that in that type of animation because, yes, they realized that would be ridiculous looking. Well, Yoda would have to tie his ears back like a, like a ponytail. <laughs> and I, I don't know if that would – that. Well, oh, oh, okay, hold on. I'm seeing some possibilities here. That's fine. That's fine. Uh, but, <laughs> I mean, this is, a, this is a great topic because I, I'll be completely honest that one of the the – constructive criticism things I would have said I have with the Acolyte in specific is the costuming choices. And again, totally, totally cognizant, totally aware that they are choices. And I'm not saying they're invalid. I'm saying that they don't necessarily work for yours truly. And I think this conversation sort of gets it why I'm struggling with it. I think that their choice definitely hits different for me. And I think that, like you said, I I think they're doing it on purpose. I think it's meant for a reason. I think they're trying to tell us something just about the Jedi Order in general in that time period and all. Um, but I do think that it kind of hamstrings them in a way that's somewhat uh, sad because it takes away an opportunity to truly tell you something about a character very quickly just by what they're wearing and then they have to find another way to try to do that and and that can be difficult when you know you only have so much time yes you got eight episodes in a series and but that can be a difficult thing to do uh and to, to find time to really give you those little intricacies i mean you see the bad batch right and immediately just from their original armor it tells you something about that character. Every part of that character has been designed to tell you something about who they are, right? Mm -hmm. And again, when you, I, I think when you constrict uh, a a costume designer in that way, uh, you do kind of uh, take away one of the the best ways to get to know a character um, because you know that's how you got to understand the character of Padme Amidala as queen as opposed to Padme um, just herself, right? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and so, yeah, I just, it is it is a really fun conversation and I'm, I'm glad we finally turned our, our, our keen eye towards uh, fashion, John. But uh, if people want fashion advice from you, uh, where would they find you? Well, I'm dispensing fashion advice 24-7, honestly, on the social medias that the kids love. Um, still not TikTok. I'm still perfecting my dance because as I understand it, you need to dance on TikTok. Uh, but you can find me as Castle Junkie out there. Um, I think the spelling is is apparent. That's your first test. You know what? That's your Smilo Ren test for me, is can you spell Castle Junkie? There you go. And of course, you can find me here on the network co-hosting a show called House Lights, where we look at the work of directors. But I also have the pleasure, and we've even done a crossover episode with uh, Aggressive Negotiations, of appearing every so often on the 602 Club with you, Matt, which is over on the TFM network. And, uh, you know, that's one of the many places they can find you online. That's true. Uh, and they can also look uh – they can also look on social media, uh, Matt Rushing Zero Two. Uh, just search for me if I'm there. That'll be the name. Uh, you can find me over uh, on the TFM network with a bunch of other shows uh, outside the 602 Club. You'll find me with a lot of Star Trek talk with the Orb, Warp Five, the Artificial Tango, Saddle Up, and sometimes on Literary Treks. And if you're a big Harry Potter fan, you can find me here on. The Nerd Party Network with Owl Post talking about every single chapter of the Harry Potter series 
one chapter at a time. But you know what, John? Um, I hear we're about to have the annual Project Runway Jedi fashion show. So I think it's time we get back to the temple and close these negotiations. Master Rushing, it is time to slay. So these negotiations are closed. Join the revolution. Join the nerd party.